Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I guess you can hear me okay. Um, so we're off to a good start this morning. Thank you so much for having me here. It is an honor to kick off BrewCon. This is a conference I've wanted to attend for many years. Uh, my friend Wim invited me many years back. I was unable to attend. So it's great to be here, uh, and it's quite nice to escape the chaos that's going on in the United States right now. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is hopefully a little bit different to what you're used to hearing about. We're talking about an opportunity, an opportunity based on the public markets, and an opportunity for you guys as security researchers as you look for ways to value your work. Last year, I participated in what I consider to be the world's first cyber short. Um, caused a lot of waves in our industry, which I was somewhat prepared for. I'm not here to rehash that. I'm not here to talk about pacemaker vulnerabilities. I'm sick of talking about pacemaker vulnerabilities. What I'm here to talk about is the business exercise of conducting a cyber short, what that experience is like, and what that presents to us as an industry. This is about a market solution for product quality and by extension, product security, WTF, because that's the reaction I got from pretty much all of my peers in industry when we embarked upon this project. Uh, that's the reaction I got from my new colleagues in the finance sector. That's the reaction I got from most of the media. That's the reaction I got from my family. That's the reaction I got from my now ex-boyfriend. Uh, so why the mass confusion? Why are we talking about this? It is my opinion that we are in somewhat dire need of innovation when it comes to business models in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, you, no doubt, have just as much experience as I do uh, dealing with shoddy technologies, shoddy companies, and now we've got um, politicians, regulators, the media, investors, consumers struggling to understand the extent of our challenges. We've got um, hackers getting arrested for questionable reasons. We've got regulators trying to implement policies with one arm tied behind their back. We've got politicians, ill-informed politicians who need our help tackling pretty complex you know, problems. Privacy uh, management, cryptocurrency regulation, product um, liability issues, the list goes on. So I really see the public markets as an opportunity for us to help highlight deficiencies and raise standards, holding companies accountable for uh, a lack of integrity, security, quality in their products. This is also, by the way, an opportunity for you to take home a paycheck at the end of the day, an alternative way for your cybersecurity research. So, you know, a lot of folks get kind of surprised this is even possible, believe it or not, outside of our industry. They're like, what are you even talking about? How does that work and how could that be okay? So I, one analogy I like to make is that you can compare this to financial analysts who look at a company's product. They look at company financial statements, spreadsheets. There are experts that analyze that, that output, just as we have experts that can analyze software. You load a spreadsheet, you load a debugger, you look at the product, you help evaluate the integrity of that company's product, and by extension, the um, integrity of the company itself. So I want to make something, uh, oh, before I jump ahead, this, this does get some people upset, especially in IoT. As you know, are well aware, I'm sure, there are a number of manufacturers and vendors out there who have been getting away with what we call security by obscurity for years and years and years, hiding behind um, intellectual property protection thanks to the DMCA. Well, now that we have some favorable exemptions in the DMCA, uh, we are able to legitimately conduct this security research. So those that were relying on this security by obscurity for years on end uh, are, are getting pretty upset about the, um, the light we're shedding on inadequacies. So yeah, just before we move forward, one thing I've noticed when I talk about this is people often jump to the wrong conclusion, which is that I'm talking about company security. I'm not. I'm talking about product security, evaluating the integrity of products, uh, highlighting deficiencies in products as a reflection of the integrity of a company. So there's one of our ex-peers uh, in industry out there who um, tackled this in a different way. I think he presents a good uh, example of what not to do. So I'm going to show you a couple of minutes of a video uh, highlighting his take on this opportunity a few years back. And you can't hear it. 
Is there anything we can do about volume? All right, well, what I'll do is I'll uh, show the video and I'll talk you through it, although if we can address this, it would be useful because there's another pretty interesting video later on. This is a guy, his name is Weave. Uh, he has questionable philosophies about life, but a few years ago, he um, served some time for a conviction related to a hack on AT&T, which is arguably not a hack, and um, came out with this idea of starting a hedge fund where he was preparing to short stocks in companies that were insecure. And his proposal was to go out there and evaluate companies and assess companies and highlight those companies that are insecure via various means, take a short position in their stock, announce the issues with the company and move forward. So, um, you know, the, the presenter here is really confused right from the get-go, and that's something that this video highlights pretty well. Uh, I think that we've had an interesting idea, possibly ahead of his time. Uh, he took, did a couple of things wrong, though. One was he focused on company security as opposed to product security, and the other was that he sort of embarked upon this mission by himself because I guess he thinks that Weave knows best, um, without partnering with other experts in industry like I would recommend. So the presentation today, we're going to be talking about financial markets as an opportunity for us to highlight deficiencies when it comes to product security uh, and to um, treat this as an opportunity to monetize our work. Uh, what does this mean? How does it work? How would it work for you if you wish to get involved? Why are we talking about it now? Uh, what to expect if you do choose to get involved, based on my experience today. Um, I had a very kind introduction earlier, so I don't think I need to rehash any of this. Um, needless to say, I usually spend most of my time on the East Coast these days in the startup community, the CEO of MedSec. I'm really excited about work we're doing in healthcare for hospitals in particular. Uh, I'm an expat Kiwi, uh, so pretty diverse background. I figured if I was going to mention all these points, I should mention that I'm also the mother of three, uh, and that's certainly not, not uh, last, last but not least. So, uh, you know, we've done a pretty good, good job in cybersecurity. I'm proud of the work that I did, and many others have taken it forward. I used to be in the lab. I used to have my heads down in a debugger called Softice, made it out onto the engineering floor. Uh, at Bloomberg, we started a software security group that, that grew, it became the information security group, climbed the, our way up the totem pole. Before you know it, you're a CISO, and if you're lucky, you're reporting to the CEO. Excellent. These days, CISOs are attend board meetings, they have face time, if not participation, with the board. So we've done pretty well, but I feel like within our industry, we've kind of taken this as far as we possibly can. We've climbed all the way up the stack and we're dealing with the board, but there's still so much confusion out there when it comes to the folks outside of our industry. Consumers are in denial or they're super paranoid, fear, uncertainty and doubt everywhere in the media. Um, you know, we've got misplaced trust, Ponemon Institute did a really interesting survey earlier this year, in May of this year, and they uh, surveyed consumers amongst other groups about their perspectives on big companies and how they protect data. And what they, an interesting point, an interesting takeaway for me, is that these consumers reported that they trust their healthcare providers more with their personal health information than they do their credit cards with, the, with their credit card data. And based on my experience, guys, it's really the other way around. So there's a lot of confusion and misplaced trust out there. The reality is, we're not doing a good job of communicating and engaging beyond our industry. We're not doing a good job of succinctly messaging what the real problems are, and we're not coming up with the right metrics. We've got a skills gap, there aren't enough people like you out there, uh, but we tend to sort of stick to the really hard problems in an insular way without learning fr from others around us and perhaps how they can engage with, for example, the public markets to help influence change. That all said, I do believe people are starting to care. And I think it's partly because these massive breaches are starting to hit home. Uh, once upon a time, you know, it was big box retail and it was, you know, big government organizations and it was industrial control system and, you know, critical infrastructure getting hit. And the average person was just kind of like, that's them, that's not me, that doesn't really affect my life. But these days, you know, we're re it really does. And I think, you know, 
folks are starting to feel it. We've got, you know, car recalls, we've got social media becoming compromised, we've got election rigging, we've got IoT recalls, home devices, home routers, you know, webcams, and of course we've got Equifax, which has affected, you know, millions of people all over the world, including most Americans. So now it's finally getting personal. We're also starting to see financial impact. So this is where it really gets interesting. As recent as 2015, we had conflicting reports about whether stocks were really impacted following a data breach. Earlier in the year, one example, HBR, why data breaches don't hurt stocks. Uh, later that same year, analysis by another researcher saying, you know what, we're starting to see a pattern here. We're starting to see a short dip in stock prices after a breach, and sure, it goes up again, but we're seeing a pattern. Fast forward to today, Equifax, down as low as 40% following the announcement of their breach. Yeah, it's climbing back up. I think it's at 20 or 25% decrease right now. We'll see where that lands, but that's a far cry from no impact. And there's cybersecurity incidents of various kinds, right, that have had, you know, um, reflection in the marketplace. We've had the, the M&A activity with the um, Yahoo acquisition where I think it ended up selling for 8% le for less than the original bidding price. There was the Jeep recall, thanks to our friends Chris and Charlie, that took 6% um, off the stock price. A couple of other studies out of Oxford in the UK, they've seen patterns of a 2% permanent decrease in stock prices following a cybersecurity breach. Uh, we're seeing operational material impact. So ransomware attacks, Petya for example, that resulted in some public companies halting trading. FedEx for example, we don't know what the real material um, cost of that was yet, but that was material impact. And of course, as I mentioned, Equifax and moving forward. So just to take a step back here, let's look at ourselves for a second. You know, I would like to think, and I think you would agree, that we see ourselves as inventors and innovators and risk takers, but I do worry if we've kinda lost our mojo a little bit. If you look at offensive security research, it's becoming very expensive. We know that. The cost of compromise is rising. That's arguably a good thing. You have gotta put a lot of work into that exploit these days. Um, and I do wonder whether the compensation models are scaling to reflect that. I do also worry about increasing compliance when it comes to deep-rooted thinking about policies such as vulnerability to disclosure. Defense, you know, I don't think there's any argument there. You know, we've got a lot of amazing minds tackling really hard problems, but yet whether it's misconfiguration or a guy forgot to tell another guy or the technology was too expensive or too confusing or, you know, whatever, we're failing to protect organizations. So I've been doing a little bit of reading lately. There's a book called The Medici Effect. It's super interesting. It's all about innovation and when amazing innovation happens. And there's this sort of innovation as a function of creativity and value, usefulness of um, the creation. Uh, and I think this is something that we could borrow from. The book talks about directional thinking, where like minds come together, solve really you know, rocket science grade problems, but everybody kind of moves in the same way of thinking. And then this place called the intersection where different perspectives come together at, and at this unique place of intersection, real creativity and real innovation um, comes about. I would say that our industry is uh, guilty of directional thinking. And I think that if we can think about opportunities to bring together different disciplines, we may um, end up coming up with more creative ideas to solve some of these problems. Just to give you this example, responsible disclosure, you know, I've had a bone to pick with this for a little while now. I'm sure you are all familiar with the term responsible disclosure. This was an initiative sponsored by Microsoft in 2002. It was genius, because those that don't comply are obviously irresponsible. Microsoft was sick of uh, some guys not playing by the rules and approaching them with their research. So they sponsored an initiative to create a new standard called Responsible Disclosure, which compels researchers to take their work directly to the manufacturer or the software vendor, say, be, be grateful for the opportunity to sit down at the table with the big boys, uh, and basically hand over the results of their labor. At that time, and I'm speaking from experience because I was in the zero-day market at that time, 
there was little incentive for, and there was little, there was a very small marketplace beyond, um, you know, the black market and government work to really monetize one's research. So researchers were appreciative. You know, this was nice for their, it was flattering. You know, these big wigs, these big tech companies want to talk to us. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you for hearing me out. So it totally worked. But what it resulted in is an undervaluation of security research a minimally sized market, because now the researchers are not going anywhere else, a closed loop NDA bound conversation between two parties, the researcher and the software vendor or the manufacturer. So nobody else has any insight into this, no idea what's going on, customers have no idea, regulators have no idea, uh, politicians have no idea, investors have no idea, it's a closed loop conversation. So this is a pretty op big opportunity for the manufacturer who is now taking control of whether they act on this information or not. And of course there's those negative connotations of irresponsibility for those that didn't sign up to the program. So moving forward, we rebranded, we called it Coordinated Disclosure, small improvement, taking away some of, some of that emotional um, innuendo re related to responsibility. We, we're embracing bug bounty programs, they have their place, they can be useful. Um, sometimes that's a third party coming into the conversation. But be wary because the compensation models and the decision to act or not still falls into the hands of the software vendor or the manufacturer. And you can see why they're not really compelled for this to change. This is a method by which the negligent companies can misrepresent product security, uh, mislead public, mislead the investors uh, about the, the quality of their product and the security of their, of their product. So that's my problem with disclosure policy. I would argue there's a case for increased disclosure, careful disclosure, but there are other influences, there are external factors out here that we can engage with to help highlight deficiencies and bring about change and raise standard when it, standards when it comes to technology and security. Customers, helping them make more informed decisions, helping them trust or not the technology upon which you know, their lives operate, the media with their content influencing customer opinion, government, you know, the evolution of regulations, laws, policies. We can help competitors with their strategy, their PR campaigns, nonprofits. But what I'm most interested in, of course, is the markets, financial analysts and investors who make the public markets. This is a vehicle by which we can raise security standards. I've spent a lot of time in the last year or so reading up on investment strategies, reading up on the ways that hedge funds think, the way activist investors think, the way short sellers think. Uh, and whether or not there's a trade or it's m and or um, some other influence that an investor is trying to exert, I pretty much always see an opportunity for us as an industry to have really useful input and help folks assess risk. As I say, just because financial, just because financial analysts are um, analyzing one form of, out, of output from a company doesn't mean that we can't follow that same model and apply our expertise by analyzing another form of output, which is the technology. And these are both valid approaches for assessing company health and, uh, and serving investors. Our new customer, investors. There's lots of different types of investors out there. It gets a little confusing. Uh, first of all, there's the big boys, there's the institutional investors, and then there's the mom and pops and the brokers, the stock brokers. Primarily, we're talking about institutional investors here, the funds, the mutual funds, the hedge funds, um, the investment banks. And then you've got what's very popular today, which is passive investment strategies versus active. Passive investment is when you take a long position in a portfolio or a stock, expecting that to rise over time. You take that position and you sit on it. You're not actively buying and selling or trading, which is what the active investors do. The active investors conduct a little bit more research. It's a little bit more dynamic. They're trying to beat the market. And then you've got the end of the extreme, which is the activists. So the activist investors are what we're primarily interested in. These are change agents. These guys are all about, all about usually highlighting negligent or bad company behavior and influencing change. And it's not always about taking a short position. 
Uh, sometimes they want to influence some M&A activity. They want to take over or a change of control. Or maybe they want board seats. It's not always about making a trade, but what they do have in common is they are very experienced, they are well-funded, they have massive teams, not just financial experts. There are multiple legal teams, there are experts, there are private investigators, there are PR firms, and I'm saying PR firms plural, they've got firms helping them work out their, their messaging around their research. And that's what they do. We think we do research. Boy, these guys spend months with their heads down, pulling things apart, um, looking at a company, how it works, how it operates, how it manufactures its products, um, mostly taking a critical eye at past behavior um, and you know, other actions and other activity that's not considered best practice, which is a term that we're all very familiar with. So it's pretty interesting when you look at the way that they work. In a way, it's similar. Research up front, result, right? Paper, bug, advisory. Um, the difference is we're pretty transparent about our research process. We have conferences like BrewCon, where I'm sure there'll be people talking about the platforms they're using and building and the fuzzing techniques and you know, amazing, amazing work. But when it comes to the output of that, the vulnerability that we've discovered, we go silent. We go behind that closed door under that NDA-bound conversation, and that research never sees the light of day. These financial um, analysts and these investors take the opposite approach. The, the, the research, super secret. Um, I've received government clearances in the background, but the level of due diligence that you go through when you're joining and participating on one of these teams is above and beyond what I went through to have a TSSCI. So they are super careful about the research process. And then um, one, when it comes to disclosing that research, they go out with a bang. And that's where the PR and the media comes into it. And you know, the more that know, the merrier, the more effective you are. So short sellers. These are a subset of activist investors that take short positions to highlight deficiencies. Short selling is a pretty... Um, nuanced trade that involves borrowing stock and selling it immediately, knowing or hoping that the value of that stock's gonna come down. Once it does, you buy back that stock and you return it, pocketing the um, profit in the process. So it's very risky. Uh, this is why there is so much due diligence and research that goes into taking a short position because there's no limit to the downside, meaning there's no, if things go wrong, the stock doesn't come down in value and instead it goes in the other direction, there's no limit to how high that can go and that can result in significant losses for, uh, for the investor. Hence the, the extensive amount of upfront uh, research that goes into these trades. There's a number of pretty well-known short sellers this is one of them. I was hoping that I could um, play you this video, but I can share these slides later so you can hear it. He has a pretty eloquent way of describing what short selling is. He likens it to buying coin or borrowing coins off your friend. No, I can't. It's really, really quiet. Um, and then the uh, interview ends with another person pointing out that these guys... Oh, there we go. All right, let me start this again. Short selling. Imagine for a moment that uh, a friend of yours collects uh, rare coins and you have the view that those coins are going to go down in value. So the way you would short those coins is you call up your friend and say, can I borrow a few of your coins? And he says, sure. Uh, and you borrow the coins. You then sell them for the thousand dollars each that they sell for in the market at the time. And then you wait for them to drop in value and you turned out to be right, and the coins dropped in value to $500. You go back into the market, you buy them back for $500. You've sold them for $1,000. You've repurchased them for $500. You've made $500 on each coin. And then you return the coins to your friend. Your, your friend is in the same place he was when he started, and he has the same coins that he started with. You might have to actually pay him something for borrowing the coins, because he, he loaned them to you. So you might pay him an interest rate. So he's happy because he's made an interest rate. It's been interest lend you the coins. You've made money uh, profiting from the decline in the value of the coins, and that's short selling. That's when it works. But if you sell it at a high price and it goes higher, and it can go infinitely higher because the stock can go infinitely higher, then you're on the hook for that. So this is why it takes big cojones to short stocks, especially something as public 
uh, and as big as, as Herbalife. Yeah, so that's a pretty interesting documentary on Netflix about um, Bill Ackman's position on Herbalife. It's an interesting story. So just a few clarifications regarding short selling because I ran into these misconceptions um, a year or so back. It's not illegal. It's not insider trading. Yes, short selling has been banned from time to time. It's usually in a period of financial meltdown. Uh, the last time around was motivated by the um, housing crisis in 2008 where short selling was banned on financial institutions for a period of time in the US. That extended on for a while longer in the EU and in other places it comes and goes. It's regulated at varying degrees um, regarding disclosure, so those that take short positions are required to disclose at a certain point um, in terms of the volume of trading. That's more heavily regulated here in Europe than it is in the US. So. Whilst I'm not an expert, I do believe that the US is one of the more favorable markets towards taking short positions in public companies. Uh, as I say, it doesn't rely on inside information. There's something called MNPI, material non-public information, and f uh, investors will run in the opposite direction when they come anywhere near MNPI. It is a big no-no, you don't do that. And that's where I think we've ran into some problems with his proposed business model, because it's very hard to evaluate a company's security based on purely public information. Uh, in fact, short selling has been shown to be a positive influence on the market, creating a more efficient market. There have been formal studies conducted over time, uh, including by the SEC when the most recent ban was lifted, not only highlighting deficiencies in company practice, but correcting um, stock prices, increasing trading activity, liquidity, uh, and um, limiting the opposite of downward pressure, upward manipulation, meaning overhyped stocks. So these activist investors, back to their research, you know, they've got these big expert teams. They bring in outside experts who go through extensive background checking, including technology experts. This is a pretty new opportunity for us, and it's mostly based around short selling for now and uh, helping these activist investors conduct this research. But I do think into the future when we see more maturity within this market for us, We'll be able to influence long positions. We'll be able to help investors make informed decisions about attractive stocks, quality technology, as, a, as in addition to deficient, uh, inadequate technology. We'll be able to contribute towards due diligence for M&A activity. Um, and even on the passive trading side of things with this algorithmic trading and high frequency trading, not just securing the algorithms, securing the implementation of these algorithms, but making them more effective and more efficient at detecting quality investments based on um, secure technologies, I think will be an opportunity for us in the future, just not yet. So what is in this for us right now? You're all familiar with bug hunting. Um, you're, you all know that if you're fuzzing something or you're looking, you're, you're reverse engineering something or you're looking at the source code, you know, if you find something in the first five minutes, chances are the thing's full of bugs, it's low quality jackpot. So we understand this concept. The thing is when it comes to trades is this is about that type of technology. It's about the low hanging, this, it's full of bugs kind of technology. This is not about an amazing vulnerability you discovered after six months of research and there's like side channel bit flipping attacks and it takes real rocket science to exploit this thing uh, because POCs aren't even good enough. To bring something like this to a trade, you need reliable, repeatable, demonstrable exploits. Um, so this is not about suspecting there's a bug and sort of, you know, saying, you know, guys, let's get this fixed, which is good enough usually in our industry. This is about the whole hog of reliable exploit development. And because it's early days in the industry, there's a certain amount of upfront legwork that would be expected of you before there's a thesis around a trade based on this research. So it's not like you can sort of say, you know, I've got this feeling, I heard this tech is kind of screwed and I think we should, you know, look at this. You've kind of got to do a bit of upfront work first, at this point anyway. Um, I'm gonna go into other factors that contribute to this, but at the end of the day, it's the bugs that are hardest to fix that are the most effective. So hardware bugs, anything initiating a recall, even firmware if there's no um, update, dynamic update of, um, capabilities would be more attractive than, you know, software bugs that can easily be ignored, brushed over, or fixed with a quick, quiet software update. 
there's a whole ton of non-technical um, criteria that go into this kind of uh, exercise. First of all, for those that participate in this type of research, be prepared to open the kimono. And that doesn't just mean somebody's going to be going over all your source code, which they will. It also means they're going to be looking up, you know, where you live, they'll be visiting your office, they'll find out your mother's maiden name, they want to know what grades you claim to have gotten at university, the whole thing. Because you've got to be squeaky clean or at least be full disclosure. Because when these, when these activist investors go out there and make these trades, Everyone's after them. Everyone's doing everything they can to discredit the research. So any little loophole where there's a false claim or a misrepresentation, people on the other side of the table are going to be all over it. Communication skills are really, really critical, and that doesn't just mean documentation of your work, but it means documentation in a way that is effective when you're trying to message this for non-technical and non-cyber audiences. Uh, so I'm talking about the mainstream media. I'm talking about regulators, potentially, not to mention lawyers. Uh, I'm talking about investors who are very good at what they do, but this is, they don't speak our language. So having folks on the team or having people who are capable of not only understanding the technology but communicating that effectively is really critical or there's just no point in doing it. And what I've found is that, you know, at this point our contributions, whilst key, probably won't be the whole story. Um, usually the cybersecurity research will be one part of a bigger picture pointing to company incompetence of some kind, whether it's misrepresentation of their manufacturing process, the way that they operate, the way they're governed, um, you know, track histories, a lack of transparency around certain past issues. Probably this will all come together as one story as opposed to it being purely about the cybersecurity itself, for now anyway. And even then, even when all this lines up perfectly, there are other deal breakers. Uh, the technology in question, first of all, has to be materially significant to the company. If the company has a whole bunch of technologies and we're criticizing one of them, that's not going to have the impact that we would need to, it to have on that company in order to compel them to address the problem. So a significant amount, significant percentage of company revenue, in other words, has to be tied to the specific technologies that are being questioned. Like I mentioned, the understandability of the problems, you know, the investors and the media and the customers, they need to really be able to wrap their heads around the attack scenario that comes out of these vulnerabilities. If it's real rocket science, it's just not gonna resonate. So that can be a significant challenge. Uh, the company track history, including past incidents of this kind, litigation, tendency to litigate. Um, regulators, whether they're involved or not, can also help move the needle in terms of this being an opportunity and a viable trade. And as I mentioned, the difficulty with fixing the problems. Um, recalls are useful. They have massive material impact. Quiet software updates, not so much. And then there's you know, the stuff that the, 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 the traders are expert at, um, the trading specs, the liquidity, the volume available, the cost of trading, like Ackman was mentioning earlier, the interest that has to be paid, all these other details that go into it. So it really does take a perfect storm. Um, just quickly on risk, we think that we're risk takers. These guys are professionals. They are expert at evaluating risk because, as we mentioned earlier, there's no limit to the downside. They are exposed tremendously when they take these positions. So that's why their research process is so thorough upfront. Um, litigation is a cost of doing business. Right from the get-go, there are litigation attorneys on the team um, who are thinking about all the worst case scenarios, the what ifs, what if they go like after this in this way, and every angle is considered and prepared for. And then there's the aggressive response from the other side, uh, who have their own teams, their own PR firms, if it's a regulated product, their own lobbyists. Uh, it really is kind of like going to war on Wall Street. So to sum up, I I'm very excited about this as an opportunity for our industry. I think this is true uh, innovation at the intersection, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a creative solution that brings together different perspectives. Uh, it's valuable. Uh, it's valuable for you. This is an alternative revenue um, opportunity for you as researchers. You can think of it as red teaming that actually does bring about behavioral change 
on the part of the company in question. We're raising standards, we're highlighting uh, inadequacies, holding companies accountable for the security, the integrity, the quality of their products, improving their operations internally, and um, perhaps most importantly, enabling end users or customers or patients to trust the technology upon which they are dependent. So key takeaways here, you know, we've, we've climbed our way up the totem pole, you know, now we're the CISO, that's awesome, we're reporting to the CEO, you know, we're getting in front of the board, we've done a great job, um, but here's the thing, the CEO, let's face it, cares about their bonus and what the board thinks. The board, bless their hearts, they're required to pay attention to cybersecurity now. They care about the financial performance of that company. So your bugs might not affect change on the part of the company, but I tell you what, they will educate the market and the market will absolutely influence company behavior. And that's why I'm so excited about this as a new vehicle. You guys have alternatives to traditional disclosure policies. You do not have to operate behind closed doors under NDA directly with the vendors and the managers. I know how exciting it is to put all that research into bug hunting only to be deflated when you see it get locked up in internal policy battles about disclosure. This is an alternative way forward and I'll just end on the note, you know, short selling is for the, for the experts out there. Uh, it's very, very risky undertaking, so let's team with them. Don't try it at home but do feel free to give me a call if you have any good ideas. Thank you so much for having me and hearing this out. I don't know how much time we've got left over, but I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>